Listen to this phrase. It happens to the one who does not work. That is the clearest statement in all the Bible, I think, that justification is by faith alone. So that when Martin Luther stuck the word alone into verse 28 of chapter 3, we reckon the man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. When he said, we reckon the man is justified by faith alone, he added that to the Bible. It's not in the text. He interpreted it correctly. Is justification something very, very different? Not God's seeing a righteousness in us that we have done, that he may have helped us do, but rather, could it be that faith being reckoned as righteousness means that there is an alien righteousness, namely God's righteousness in Christ, which is credited to our account through faith, and that these words, he credits faith as righteousness, are meant to carry that meaning not the meaning that the faith is the righteousness that we provide as the basis of our justification. What difference will this make in your life right now or this afternoon? What difference will it make? It made a difference for Luther. He said it was like walking into paradise. It made a difference for Bunyan. It was like the end of years of torture of conscience. What would you pay this morning for the knowledge and the assurance that your legal standing before the judge of the universe is as secure as the righteousness of his son. This is a magnificent exchange. Jesus never sinned. He knew no sin. He was perfectly righteous. He upheld the glory of God in every feeling that he felt and every uh, emotion that he had, every decision he made, every act he did. He upheld the glory of God. And you and I sin every day. We blackball God day and night. We give him a vote of no confidence. Thank you. As we go our own way every day of our lives. And God says to this perfect son of the living God, I will take their sin and make you sin. And I will take my righteousness, which you have so gloriously upheld in your sacrifice, and give it away from you to them. Now that is the gospel. Piper speaks in great swelling words of emptiness, promising people liberty in Christ while they remain slaves to their corruption. We've heard the quotes... We heard just four, four quotes, four clips that we played from various messages that he's preached. And here they define faith in this package form, that you receive everything that you need in this package. You receive his righteousness and his holiness and his obedience and his steadfastness, and you don't have to do anything except trust that you receive this. Even the faith itself cannot be credited to you, because that would be works. See, just like he said in that one quote, even the faith. But, but we see in the scriptures that faith is obedience. As we put on our board here, that faith is obedience. You believe from your heart that form a doctrine to which you're delivered, like Romans 6.16 says. Or in the NIV, it speaks of believing wholeheartedly. You know, James would refute these men. The book of James, they have to throw it out. Of course, Luther, he quotes Luther in one of, his, one of his quotes. And Luther would have thrown out the book of James because it talked about that faith alone is no good. In James 2, uh, verses 20 through 24, he says, You foolish man, 
Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor considered righteous for what he did? See, what he did, what he did by faith when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. That's what justifies. See, that's what just working together through that faith, through the grace that's imparted through that faith, and it was made complete by what he did, and the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. What's credited to him as righteousness? Just the righteousness? He says Abraham believed God. The belief is what he did. It was evidenced by what he did, as we'll, as we'll see here in a minute. And he was called God's friend. So you see, a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Now, Piper said it was by faith alone and that Martin Luther was correct. Well, I'd say he was incorrect. And I say Piper's incorrect because he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's not by faith alone. As we see of Abraham, Abraham believed God. Yes, it says in Romans 4, 4, verses 4 and 5, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That happens to the one that does not work. You heard that quote. That's all he quotes. But, but it also talks about Abraham walked the walk of faith, did the works of faith, and obeyed God in, in Hebrews eleven six. So we see Abraham walked the walk of faith, worked the works of faith, and obeyed from his heart through faith. Then it was credited to him as righteousness, as we see in Romans 4.22. That's what faith is. That's the only type of faith that's going to save someone. These guys preach this alien righteousness. See, that's, what, that's what Piper loves to call it. He calls it a, a transfer, a covering, a magnificent exchange that takes place. And we'll, we'll key in on that a, a little bit more in a few minutes. See, but faith is anything but obedience to these people. They cannot equate faith and obedience together. Because if they do, it would be a work. But faith is a work. It's a work of an obedient heart unto God. Abraham believed God. Abraham obeyed God. We see in, in that Abraham's strong faith in the promise of the coming Savior was essential to his faith. It was reckoned to him for justification. For it is not said that any righteousness, either his own or another, was imputed to him or reckoned to him for justification. It says faith. It doesn't say anybody was tra anything was transferred here. But it's his faith. His faith was fully persuaded of the most merciful intentions of God's goodness in this which in effect laid hold on Jesus Christ, the future Savior, as the means of that justification, being reckoned unto him in the place of personal righteousness, because it laid hold of the merits of him who died to make atonement for our offenses and rose again for our justification. That's the gospel. Not what this maniac is saying. This guy's saying the gospel is transfer. Jesus transfer. There's no transfer taking place here with Abraham. Abraham did the works of faith. Was working his actions were working together with his faith, and it was made complete by what he did. Then the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God that was credited to him as righteousness. What was credited to him as righteousness? What he did by faith from his heart. You see the key here? The missing element of what these guys preach is what's going to cancel out the saving power of faith. That's the reason Satan formed this, this reformed theology nonsense that these men preach. So Romans 4.22 says it all. This is the reason. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul, understanding the elements involved here, how important it was to understand what faith is, the dynamic behind it, that it fulfills the law, that it upholds the law, that it establishes the law, that it works by love, that it walks in the righteous requirements of the law, all those things the scripture says, and the things James says here, then it's credited as righteousness. Sure, it's... it's originates from a broken-hearted repentance. Sure, it's empowered by His grace, imparted by the Holy Spirit, but it still is obedience from the heart. That doesn't merit anything before God, but it obeys God, obeys His command, and then it's counted as righteousness. See, so when a person is completely seared and can sin with impunity and do whatever they want to do, 
Just like Luther, you know, he said, oh, it was so glorious. It was so glorious when I found this truth. Yeah, well, what was so glorious? That he could sin all he wanted and still be declared righteous in his sins. That's what those men taught. They taught that constantly, just like these modern guys do. That you can be declared righteous while you remain sinful. We have, we have tremendous amount of quotes to that extent. That they say that very thing. That's the glorious gospel to these things. But what's at stake? What's at stake here is your soul is at stake. Because if you sin willfully against grace, claiming that you got fire insurance, then it's death to the soul. Just like Romans 8, 8 6 and 8, 13 says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Meaning, you'll die and go to hell. If you're carnally minded, it's death. Uh, like Galatians uh, uh, 6, 9 and 10 talks about you reap what you sow. You sow according to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. You sow according to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap lever everlasting life. It's, it's the decree of God. It's how He arranged this to be. So faith is obedience from the heart. Not this uh, convoluted nonsense that these men are saying. They won't even mention the word obedience. They won't even talk about how Abraham walked and worked and obeyed and was fully persuaded. And then it was... They'll never, you've ever heard any of these wolves read Romans 4, 19-22? They never, well, I'm sure they have some explanation for it if in their Bible studies, but they never bring that out. Why? Because it clearly shows the error of what they're teaching. That they're trying to say one moment of faith placed in this package is a forever done deal. Now listen to this next batch of clips while these guys tell you what the gospel is. And we'll focus in on that magnificent exchange again and what he's, talk, what he's talking about there, and how we blackball God, and, and uh, how uh, everything's forgiven in advance. Who took the initiative to get God's wrath off of God's people? God. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God himself is not content that God's wrath rest upon God's children. And he removes it by sending his son. He sweeps it away. His love and his justice conspire to find a way to remove the wrath of God against sinners, and preserve the holiness of God. He cannot sweep sin under the rug of the universe. He cannot say, oh, it doesn't matter. I'll just let you off. I'll take my wrath away from you. He can't do it. And so he finds a way. He sends his only son and pours his wrath on the son. And he absorbs it for us and removes it, propitiates it. The righteousness is God's righteousness. It's His. It's perfect. It's holy. It's utterly unimpeachable. It's all we'd ever need. And now it is on the way, not through works, as though you could somehow imitate it or earn it, but through faith as a gift to, to rest upon you and clothe you and be there for you, covering you. Now, I, I want you to get this because... Picture this. It's the once for allness in history outside of us objectively that guarantees that all of our sin is covered past, present, and future. If it were such that the death of Christ were a kind of parable that we reenact week by week or month by month, then indeed we would have no security that all my sin is gone, is taken care of. But if it's true, as Hebrews 9.26 says, Christ 
appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, then it's over. It's over. The sin that I will commit on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, was put away 2,000 years ago. Finished. Over. That sin is over. It's gone. It will not be held against me. Now, if that doesn't grip you as the most glorious news in all the world, I can't imagine what would be good news. That all the sins that I have committed will commit, perhaps even while I'm preaching by some attitude of mine, or tomorrow will not be held against me. Why? Because at the end of the age, Christ appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. And you and I sin every day. We blackball God day and night. We give Him a vote of no confidence. Thank you. As we go our own way every day of our lives. And God says to this perfect Son of the living God, I will take their sin and make you sin. And I will take my righteousness, which you have so gloriously upheld in your sacrifice, and give it away from you to them. Now that is the gospel. Now did anybody ever tell Jesus that this is the gospel? Like Piper says, this is the gospel. He keeps claiming. Well, see, to the gospel, to him, is the exchange, the magnificent exchange that takes place. He takes all our sin and he puts it on Jesus and he puts all our righteousness of Christ on, on us and it's done deal forever. And that's not what happened with Abraham here as we see on our notes. Abraham had to walk, believe, obey, work. Then it was credited to him as right. It doesn't say anything about any kind of a transfer. Just like everything else Jesus taught, he didn't teach this magnificent exchange. He didn't say that my righteousness would be given in exchange for your sins. Where is that in the gospel? Where is it in the parables? Why didn't Jesus imply this to someone, to, to somebody in, in the scriptures? Why when the rich young man came to him and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why didn't Jesus tell him, well, you know, you do this and this and the commandments as you've done from your youth there, like you said, uh, but trust in my accomplishment on the cross and it's, you'll get in the kingdom. Well, he could have made it very clear to that young man that that's all he needed to do was trust in his accomplishment, and it would be a done deal. But no, he told him to go sell all of his goods, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. In other words, just like Abraham had to come and follow Jesus, Jesus, the future, the future Savior, as, as we read that quote, of being fully persuaded of the most merciful intentions of God. That's what the rich young man had to do. How about the virgins, uh, the man with the talents, the unforgiving servant, the prodigal son who sinned against heaven? See, sinning against heaven is sinning against your birthright. The scripture, that's what the scriptures teach. You're sinning against heaven and against God. You're sinning against your birthright. You're forfeiting your salvation. That's exactly what happened to him. It talks about how he was dead and he uh, was alive again. It says that twice in that parable. But how come none of these people, none of the, vir the virgins or the, the man with the talents wasn't told? How, co how come that they, they had to work to hear those words, Well done, now good and faithful servant, and enter, enter into thy rest? Why? See, the reason that, this is the reason you'll never hear these guys, Piper and these guys, preach the narrow way, or strive to enter through the narrow gate, or work out your salvation with fear and trembling that as, as it is mandatory to get into the kingdom. They'll talk about that, but they, it, it's not. It's supplementary to salvation. It's not mandatory to get into the kingdom to work out your salvation or to make your calling and election sure or run the race with endurance or any of the other things or take up your cross or fight the good fight of faith. The, all those things are supplementary, but it wasn't for Abraham. We go back to Abraham. He had to do all these things before he was declared righteous in the sight of God by that faith. That faith being credited to him is that righteousness that he didn't have any. Per he was an idolater before, wasn't he? As all of us were in, in, our, in our sins and heathenistic before God would declare us righteous, not by transfer, but by a faith that works. So why didn't Jesus teach this? Why didn't he just merely say, just trust in that, and that's the, that's the essence of your salvation? But see, 
they won't teach it. See, they won't teach obedience to his commands. Because obedience to his commands then merits something in, in these guys, in, like in, in Piper's mind or in MacArthur or any of these other guys. It's works. So the principle behind a working faith that cleanses and purifies the heart from sin, as we said, faith purifies the heart from sin. It has victory over the world. It works by love, as the scripture says. That's the three things you can prove in the scriptures that faith is. The principle behind that faith is gone. It's, it's null and void. It's rendered ineffective. That's why the gospel's been rendered ineffective, to save anybody from their sins. Because all they're doing is accepting this package, a cloak for their sins. No, no better off than the Pharisees. Dying to self and sharing in Christ's sufferings? Well, none of those things are necessary. See, in the package, it's not necessary to die to self-interest. It's not necessary to take up your cross and deny yourself and lose your life for Christ's sake. Why? Because He did it for you. See, He did the dying, but the Scripture says, For he who has died has ceased from sin, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. That's what he said about suffering, that he who has died with Christ has ceased from sin. The same thing Paul talked about in Romans chapter 6. And that we having died to sin might live for righteousness. How are we going to live for righteousness? By walking, working, believing, obeying, by faith. Through the power of his grace. That's what Paul, that's what Paul and Peter both taught. So we blackball God day and night. Give them a vote of no confidence, thank you, as, as this, this wolf says. Is that the Christian life? I think that's outrageous. That's outrageous. How can you still remain righteous when you violate everything God teaches and all His laws and, and His decrees every day of your life? What happened to doing what's right? What's happened to the righteousness of God is doing what's right? As John, as John says in 1 John uh, 3. It says, Dear children, don't let anybody lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. Because the devil has sinned from the beginning. And this is the reason that the Son of God was manifest or appeared. To destroy the works of the devil. Which is what? Sin. Which is sin in man's heart. The corrupting influence of sin. No one born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning. These guys say you go right on sinning. You, you, re, you remain wretched. They all say it. They all say it. So they're liars. John said you can't. He cannot because he's born of God. And this is how we know the children of God and the children of the devil. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And you and I sin every day. We blackball God day and night. We give Him a vote of no confidence, thank you, as we go our own way every day of our lives. Then it's over. It's over. The sin that I will commit on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, was put away 2,000 years ago. Finished. Over. That sin is over. It's gone. It will not be held against me. Now, if that doesn't grip you as the most glorious news in all the world, I can't imagine what would be good news. That all the sins that I have committed will commit, perhaps even while I'm preaching by some attitude of mine, or tomorrow will not be held against me. Why? Because at the end of the age, Christ appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I don't know how much more clear it could be. How much more plain as the nose on your face... It could be that righteousness is doing what is right from your heart by faith through the power of His grace. John couldn't have made it more clear. You don't lose your assurance. You don't lose your, your, uh, your rewards. You are of the devil if you live in sin. It's black and it's white. There's a line in the sand here. There's no middle of the road. There's no vagueness to this. They talk about how, well, if you're not living right, if you don't love your brother, you have no joy. Well, yeah, you have no joy, all right, because you ain't going to make it into the kingdom. 
You have no assurance. You certainly have no assurance because your conscience condemns you. God help you if your conscience is not condemning you anymore. Then you're in, you're in that bliss I talked about, the ignorance bliss that because you're totally deceived. But so, he deceives you with these empty words, saying that that type of behavior is not going to keep you out of the kingdom when the scripture says it will. In First Corinthians six nine and ten, and Galatians five nineteen through twenty one, we can put those lists up on the screen now. Very sins of the flesh that will disqualify you from the kingdom. Fornication, drunkenness, lying, cheat, stealing, wrath, strife, envy, jealousy, covetousness, extortions. All those things it says in those scriptures will disqualify you from the kingdom. But they say, no, no, these people are still saved, uh, but they'll lose their rewards. They'll lose their joy. They'll lose their assurance. I say hogwash. I say, do let anybody deceive you with empty words. And that's what these men are doing. They're deceiving you with empty words. If you're blackballing God every day and night by your actions and your behavior in the way you preach or the way you convey yourself, then you're, something is seriously wrong with your faith. It's not Abraham's faith. It's not the faith that obeys, that works, that walks, that's credited as righteousness because righteousness is doing the right thing. Very plain, very plain in the scriptures. I don't know how you can miss this. I don't know how you can still cling to this so-called Reformed theology nonsense because they can rip a few verses out of context and force them, mold them to mean something that is entirely, entirely outrageous. It, it, just, it just blows my mind. Extending these passages like he does in Hebrews 9.26 and 10.10 to mean that mankind's future sin is already forgiven. You know, it's all done, sanctified forever, in advance. If we merely trust Christ, it's not only an error in doctrine, but it negates every warning against sin that's contained in the Bible. And you people buy it. You people buy it. Well, it does say for, forever sanctified. Those who are being sanctified, he has saved forever. But what about the warnings in the scriptures? What about Romans 6, Romans 8, uh, 1 through 4, about walking in the flesh? If you walk in the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom. See, if you, if you continue to live according to the flesh, you will not inherit the kingdom. Hebrews 10, 20, 26 uh, through 31, which we'll discuss in, in greater detail later. The greatest warning in the Bible, sinning willfully against your knowledge of the truth. No sacrifice remains. Boy, they ripped that scripture to shreds. It's very plain warning. See, these men are dangerous beyond any of your wildest imaginations. They're causing millions of people to perish in the flames of hell. And unless somebody starts casting down these guys' arguments in the strongholds of false doctrine that they've erected in our churches, in the accumulative effect that it's had upon the congregations that are under your tutelage right now, the pastors and Sunday school teachers, then more people are going to be lost. A generation of people are going to be lost into the mouth of hell by these horrible doctrines. Our, our country is devastated by this preaching. Listen to another aspect of this teaching, how uh, you can never be righteous, not even with God's help. Listen to this thing. The righteousness is God's righteousness. It's His. It's perfect. It's holy. It's utterly unimpeachable. It's all we ever need. And now it is on the way, not through works, as though you could somehow imitate it or earn it, but through faith as a gift to, to rest upon you and clothe you and be there for you, covering you. You're pronounced righteous, and you can't even imitate His righteousness. Somebody should have told Paul that. Because Paul says twice in Corinthians, twice where they get all their passages about the, the carnal Christians of Corinth, 
where they get all their excuses about the fat man in 1 Corinthians 5.5 5, that was in sin and all this other nonsense that they love to teach to defend sin. Paul says, invitate me as I invitate Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 4.16 and 1 Corinthians 1.11. And the same word is used by Peter in 1 Peter 2.21 to follow in his steps. It's the same thing. Invitate. Follow. It says, I think the King James Version translates that word follower. Be a follower of Christ as I am a follower of Christ. It means to invitate Christ. How are you going to do that? By working, walking, obeying from your heart, doing what is right. That's how. Through the power of His grace imparted to you through the exceeding great and precious promises being a partaker, made a partaker of the divine nature. That's how. Adding to your faith. Being diligent to make your calling and election sure. That's how. See, these men never tell you that. These wolves will never tell you that. They'll tell you it's a done deal. You can uh, be a bad teacher and a bad... You'll hear another, the next quote. Let you hear this next quote. So you have this, this, this righteousness that's merely covering you. So God never sees you sinning anymore. He just looks at you through this Jesus filter, as some of them call it. You're pronounced forgiven while you continue to commit adultery and lie and cheat and steal and everything else. That's the reason we got churches full of people like that. See, and who can tell the difference between one that was never saved to begin with and one that's living in sin, the, the so-called carnal Christian? See, nobody could. You, there's nothing that these guys, these wolves could say to incriminate the behavior of someone living in sin because they preach that you can live in sin and still be saved. That justification is purely forensic, does not affect your behavior, it will not affect anything about your conduct. It's just purely a pronouncement of God, a legal transaction, so to speak, and you're pronounced righteous, sinless, cast behind God, not remembered anymore. He loves to quote, Piper loves to quote that scripture, how it's cast behind God. He's not going to remember it against me. I can sin now, today, tomorrow, uh, next week, and God's not going to hold it against me. It, really? Is that what the scriptures teach? That he who covers his sin shall not prosper. He who sins willfully against his knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice remains. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Should I go on? Should I go on? There's hundreds of scriptures warning you to presume upon God that you're forgiven in advance to live that type of a life. Uh, it's outrageous. As though there can be adulterated Christians, adulterers, Christian murderers, Christian child molesters, fornicators, Christian drunkards, drug addicts, Christians that smoke, drink, cuss, lie, steal. It's, it, it, it doesn't make sense. There are none. See, because what's John say? This is how we know who the children of God are and the children of the devil. How? How do we know that? What did, what did John say? Who does not do what is right? Right. Who does not do what is right. That's how. That's how. Who does not do what is right. Is not of God. It's very, very simple. Now listen listen to this next one. This next one will blow your mind too. How uh, you can be a, a bad... He doesn't define what bad is. He just says it. Listen to this. In other words, it's possible to be a Christian and a bad teacher. It is possible to be a Christian and a bad Sunday school teacher. It is possible to be a Christian and a harmful small group leader. It is possible to be a Christian and a bad pastor, a harmful teacher of God's people because of doctrinal errors that are imparted, attitudinal blind spots that are shared, behavioral patterns out of sync with the foundation that are transferred over to a church or a Sunday school class or a small group or children in the home. And when the Lord comes and these are all burned up like wood, hay and stubble, you lose your reward. Your joy is lessened in what might have been a great celebration of a lifetime of fuller faithfulness. Oh, my. Uh, Peter calls this the error of the wicked. In uh, 2 Peter uh, 3, he, he, he says that, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, 
Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. I include that's in verse 14. So you be diligent to found, be found by him without spot and blameless. Well, how could you be without spot and blameless if you're wallowing all the time? You can't under their doctrine. So you therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, beware, lest you fall from your own steadfastness. See, you fall from your own steadfast endurance, being led away in the error of the wicked. The error of the wicked is the same word as strong delusion, as the mini antichrist, as the false prophet. It's all the same thing. Being led away, stray, stray from the path, swerving from the truth is what this is talking about. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. That's 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. That's what Peter says about this business about bad, bad Christians, bad teachers, bad Sunday school teachers and youth directors. Again, I refer back to John. This is how we know the difference between the children of God and the children of the devil. You don't do what is right, you're of the devil. You, didn't, it's not, you didn't lose your joy, you lose your assurance, you lose your rewards. You're of the devil. It's not wood, hay, and stubble that's going to be burned up as it refers to that 1 Corinthians 3 passage. That's not talking about that. That passage is talking about you defile the temple of God in verse 16. He said, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, you'll be destroyed. That's one of the strongest words in the New Testament, to be utterly, completely destroyed. What's the temple of God? The temple setting up on the hill over there in Jerusalem? No, you're supposed to be the temple of God, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So, what do they say? He who sins is of the devil. Disobedient, professing Christians? What are going to be his converts? They're going to be obedient to the truth? Trying to uh, save their self? Claiming a working faith? I don't think so. Not with what these guys preach. So this is an awesome contradiction. This, 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 bad Christian, this bad Christian quote. Because what sin, forgiven in advance and cast behind God's back, could possibly, could possibly put you beyond hope? But see, we'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear that in a minute. But he says, you know, you'll be saved as through fire. You'll be, you have your sins forgiven in advance. But surely, what's at stake here? What's at stake? Your rewards, your joy, your assurance, or your soul? See, what happened to the unfaithful and the people that weren't ready, the slothful servants in the parables? What happened to them? I referred to them a little while ago about the parables, about the virgins and the, uh, the parable of the talents and the minas and, the, and all the other parables, the unforgiving servant. What happened? Who heard, well done, now good and faithful servant, enter into your rest, or depart from me, you wicked and lazy servant, and be cut off with the hypocrites, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth? What was the difference between those, those, those two batches of servants? The difference is what they did. That's the only difference between the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares, and what they did by faith, how they worked, walked, obeyed from their heart, and did what was right. That's the difference. That's what's going to get you into the kingdom or not get you into the kingdom. So you want to hear, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. By the way, it's in Matthew 24, 51, if you want to check that out. That's, that's just one of the places. Are you going to hear the well done, now good and faithful servant? Well, under this Piper's doctrine, you couldn't possibly hear that because that would be works. So you'd be able to walk down the golden streets and claim someday that you got, you got yourself in there. Now, I don't really don't think that that's what faith is about. The faith in the merits of Christ is about Him and Him alone, giving you the power to live above the corrupting influence of sin through the exceeding great and precious promises by faith to add to your faith, to make your calling sure, so that you don't stumble and fall, so that your entrance into the kingdom will be guaranteed. So it's not guaranteed if you're living in sin. Now listen to this next batch of clip where he talks about uh, sinning beyond hope. You know, this really shows the contradiction where they try to pretend that they're preaching against sin, but in reality, uh, it's still all the same message. You cannot have the assurance of salvation if you are not 
a loving person. Persistence in sin destroys the assurance of salvation. A whole branch of evangelical theology has been developed to provide assurance for disobedient professing Christians in our day. And this book of 1 John is written by the Holy Spirit to blow that theology out of the water. Sin is serious because it jeopardizes our assurance. More on that next week. Finally, sin is serious, fourth, because it can put you beyond the reach of hope. Turn to chapter 5, verse 16. I'm going to translate it literally so that you can catch the implications. If anyone sees his brother sinning sin, committing sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and God will give to him life, namely to those who are sinning not unto death. There is sin that is unto death. Not concerning that, do I say, you should request. All right, unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. Now, those verses are a summary of all the warnings of this letter. There are many. And those verses are intended to help us avoid two errors. The one error would be the claim that any sin you commit after conversion is your damnation. You're done for if you sin after conversion. And this verse avoids that error by saying at the beginning of verse 16 and at the end of verse 17, no, there is sin not unto death. And the other error that these verses keep us from falling into is the claim that any sinning you do after you make a profession of faith doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. And the verses keep us from making that error by saying, yes, there is sin unto death. Don't even pray for it. There is sin that puts us beyond hope. There is a habit of insubordination against God that becomes so strong that you can no longer confess it with authenticity. First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sins. And he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There is a sinning that puts you beyond the ability to do that. And oh, how we play with fire when we say, I can sin and I'm safe because I prayed once to receive Jesus. There comes a point when you may never be able to see or feel sin the way God does and hate it the way he does it and flee from it. And that's what confession means. So John, in the great love with which he loves his little children and this John, in the love with which he loves Bethlehem, says. I say these things to you that you might not sin because it's very serious it insults the suffering of Christ. It suggests we have the nature of Satan and not God. It jeopardizes our assurance of salvation. And it may put us beyond the reach of hope. See, he claims that there's been a system developed to protect disobedient professing Christians. But how can that be? 
How can that be? Because all the people under this doctrine are disobedient to the truth. They're not going to walk and obey and work because that would be a work salvation. And everybody knows it's not of works and they're not perfect and you can't judge. And they, everybody knows those things. They don't know nothing else. They know those things. So how can there be any disobedient professing, anything but disobedient professing Christians? So you see what an awesome contradiction we have here. He's talking about these people that sin beyond hope, sin so heinously that they may not be able to repent anymore when all sins forgiven in advance, cast behind God's back, and He doesn't remember it against you anymore. So what could be at stake then that He's talking about? Certainly it couldn't be ultimate salvation because that's a done deal to him. So he belabors the point here to make it sound like he's coming out against sin and warning people about God's vengeance. And that's why these guys are so tricky. But see, it loses its effect when we remember back what he said about how you blackball God and you can't do nothing right and how you bad Christians and bad Sunday school teachers that lead other people astray. And we already know that John said that can't be. So what is this sin unto death that he talks about? He never tells you what it is. Why? Because well, there couldn't possibly be a sin unto death. Does Piper believe that God will kill you and take you home? Well, I'm, I'm not sure he does. Some of these guys do. I'm not sure if Piper does, so I won't say. But nevertheless, some of these guys do. So what is the sin? Who can make the call? See, who can incriminate the behavior of a person, no matter how horrible or how heinous it is, no matter how much he's wallowing in sin, as long as he's a professed Christian, who can incriminate his behavior and say, well, you were never saved to begin with, because look at you. You're still fornicating, you're still lying and cheating and taking drugs. No, no, I walk the aisle, I said the words. I have this transfer. It's not my righteousness, it's his. I don't have to have any. See, because all sins forgiven in advance, God can no longer hold you accountable for it. Didn't Piper say that? He said God is going to forgive him Monday for the sins he hadn't even committed yet and won't even remember them against him. So how can he incriminate anyone else for sinning? He can't. You see the contradiction here? Now listen to him mold his words, explaining away the warnings to God's saints in this next batch of clips. And this will be the final portion of this entire message. And every time you or I sin as believers, He doesn't propitiate the sin afresh. He doesn't die again and again and again. He takes His portfolio and He spreads it out on the bench before His Father, the Judge, and He shows Him pictures of Gethsemane crown of thorns, lashing, mocking, scourging, crucifixion, cry, it is finished. And then perhaps just holds up his hands. See, the work of Christ in his advocacy and his propitiation are really one work. Because what he pleads, what he makes a case out of before the Father is his own death. He just lays himself and his crucified self before the Father. His portfolio as our advocate is his propitiation. And John means that we should therefore not despair. We dare not say we have no sin, but in order not to despair since we do have sin, we have to take thought that we have an advocate who is making his case before the Father right now, not on the basis of our perfection, nor is he a deceiver. He is Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is making his case on the basis of the historical work that he performed on Calvary. Christ's portfolio. He begins this with Christ's portfolio. And here we, be, we see the forensic nature of this package, this justification package that these guys preach. Purely just a legal transaction between God and man. Nothing to do with changing his behavior or reforming his conduct. As though you can get married and remain unfaithful to your spouse. You can, you can show up at the wedding ceremony after you just went out with your girlfriend 
or your, your wife could show up there after just going with her last boyfriend and say, oh, that's okay, now we're going to get married. See, now it's, now it's an official document claiming we're married. No, be, when you were betrothed to be married, even before the marriage was consummated and made legal in the eyes of man, you were faithful to one another, so your behavior was affected. You see how lame these guys come out with this forensic thing? So your behavior has got to be affected if you're going to be accepted into the beloved, if you're going to be, declared, be, be righteous by doing the right thing, if you're going to be cleansed by the blood, if, if you're going to be uh, receiving the joy of your sins forgiven. But that's what these guys teach. It's outrageous. Now, it's outrageous. See, could you imagine Jesus, uh, like he like he alluded to? Can you imagine Jesus pleading with the Father, Father, with this portfolio showing the pictures of his crucifixion and his sufferings to his Father, and pleading for these sinful followers? Oh, I know they're not perfect, Father. I know they're full of sin, but transfer my righteousness to them. It's so outrageous it almost makes you sick. What should Jesus say in Matt, in Revelation 22? In Revelation 22, here's what he says. In the final judgment of man. The words of Jesus now. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. He didn't say anything about covering that vileness with his righteousness. Let him who does right continue to do what's right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I come soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, and the beginning and the end. Revelation 22, 11 through 13. And we'll put it up on the screen as well. That's what Jesus says. If you're vile, you're vile. If you're doing the wrong thing, you're doing the wrong thing. You're not doing the right thing because you trusted that he did the right thing for you. It's ludicrous. This is the last judgment. You're going to be judged according to what you have done, like Abraham here, what you did by faith through the power of his grace imparted unto you. You see how important this is? That you believed, you walked, you worked, and you obeyed, and you did what was right. Then it was credited to his righteousness. That's what that passage means. So this is just, just outrageous what he says about this portfolio. Peter would say, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, the end of the world, as he said right previously that, 2 Peter 3.14, be diligent to be found by him without spot and blameless. Why? If you're already without spot and blameless because it's transferred to you by this package, why do you have to be diligent? You see, none of this makes any sense. There's none of this stuff stands up by itself. So who's preaching the truth? Is Piper preaching the truth? Or is the Bible declaring the words of truth? I say Piper's preaching great swelling words of emptiness. It's going to put your soul in hell if you continue to follow him. Now listen to this next clip about Hebrews chapter 10 and how they butcher this clip. Now the question is, who were they? Where did they come from? What kind of people were they before this happened to them? And that's what makes this text really controversial. There are three descriptions of them, and we close by a brief look at this description. The first one is in verse 26. These are people who have the knowledge of the truth. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. The casualties of God's wrath in this text are people who have trampled upon the Son knowingly. They know the truth. The Bible teaches that we will all be judged according to the measure of light and truth that we have. And we have a lot. They were walking away from Christ in the broad daylight of the truth. Secondly, they are described 
surprisingly to our ears, I think, as God's people. Look at verse 30. To explain what's happening in divine vengeance, he says at the end of verse 30, the Lord will judge his people. Now that is very important to understand the dynamic of this text. You must come to terms with the fact that this judgment, this wrath, this fire, this anger is coming against my people, says the Lord. What's that mean? I believe it means that this writer sees the visible church, the church that shows up on Sunday morning, the visible church. He sees the visible church the same way he saw the people of Israel. God's people, right? All saved? Wrong. And every biblical writer knew all God's people weren't saved. Externally, he calls them the people of God. He even calls them brothers, holy brothers, in chapter 3, giving them all the benefit of the doubt that their profession of faith in the Messiah is true. But there are many hypocrites, both in Israel and in the church of Jesus Christ, visibly. The visible church and the true church of the elect are not identical. And the Bible often treats the visible church as the people of God. And so these people who have entered into willful sinning and left behind the sacrifice of the Son trampling Him under their feet are my people up to a certain point. Now he covered a lot of ground. I think that clip is about five minutes or a little more than five minutes long. Starting out with who were they and it's controversial and it's nothing controversial about this passage whatsoever. We can put Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 up on the screen a couple of times while we're going through this. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no sacrifice remains for sin but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation that would devour all the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. He destroys this passage like all these teachers do. But Piper really does a job on this thing. Really, really does a job. He, try, he belabors the point to explain away the obvious. But see, first of all, this knowledge of the truth that he talked about, that they knew God, but it wasn't enough knowledge, you look that up, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll flash that up on the screen there, too, for you in the, the meaning of it in the Greek. It means full and complete knowledge. The same word is used throughout the Scriptures to describe the saints who knew God as a husband knows wife, his wife in an intimate knowledge of God. It's talking about the saints, the salvation. So the first lie is blown out of the water here. It's full and complete knowledge of God that they had. He implies that they knew him, but obviously they were still unsaved. Obviously wrong. Now he suggests that not all these people are God's people. And then he tries to make his case that many of God's people are actually hypocrites and they reside among the saints, like the sheep and the goats and the wheat and the tares. And back in the Old Testament, uh, we have so many examples. It's a valid point, but it's not part of this text. See, we're dealing here with holy brethren. He even mentioned that, that they were called holy brethren, and he still incriminates them. And again, I go back to what I said about how could any, how could any of these guys incriminate the behavior of anyone when they said he can be forgiven for sins he hadn't even committed yet? How can you incriminate someone else? Talk about judging. It's nonsense. 
But these people were steadfast and enduring. They were illuminated, it says in this passage. You've seen that in the, in the passage. They were illuminated, enlightened, that scripture is used in Ephesians 1.18, having the eyes of your understanding enlightened. So that scripture is used throughout the scriptures. It's even used in Hebrews 6, 6 4, that they tasted the heavenly gift. They were enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift. It's used to describe the saints that are doing the will of God from their heart, like Abraham here. Doing the will of God. I keep referring back to that because that's the, that's the crux of the entire matter. What is faith? So the language of the text reveals beyond any doubt whatsoever that these were indeed God's people. Piper's painstaking attempt to incriminate the, these people falls flat on its face, just like his doctrine does. He can't possibly, just like I said, the contradiction is glaring. He says, you blackball God. He says he sins all the time. He sins, and he's going to be forgiven for the sins he commits next week, and they're already not even held against him, cast behind God's back. How can he incriminate these people? For what? For what? How can he know? How can anyone know? See, the only reason he's doing this is because this decimates this so-called eternal security nonsense that they teach. Who can tell the difference? If everybody wallows day and night, what evidence is there that these people, although they're sinning, or being at least warned against sin, willful sin, they're being very severely warned, but justified forever, how can any sin be charged against them? See, it couldn't possibly be. So now then the real twist comes in. Here's the real twist, and we'll get into the, to the second batch of this here in a second. He, get, you get, he gets into the, to, the next, to the next batch here, about these people were sanctified, but not really sanctified. Listen, listen now to uh, what he says. I think this is maybe three or four minutes this, this uh, next half. Finally, the most controversial of all is in verse 29. They are sanctified. They were sanctified. How much severer punishment do you think will he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean or common the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? Wow. That's scary. So, uh, the question is whether or not it does jeopardize eternal security. And if not, why not? I do not embrace the rejection of eternal security. And I don't think this verse calls it into question. First of all, because elsewhere in the book it is so powerfully taught. Let me just give you two key verses. Hebrews 3.14 says, We have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast our begin the beginning of our assurance to the end. Which means if you don't hold fast the beginning of your assurance to the end, you had not become a partaker of Christ. Perseverance to the end in faith is a sign that you did become a partaker. Failure to persevere to the end is a sign that you did not ever become a partaker of Christ. That's what that verse seems to me very clearly teaches. Here's one that we just talked about a few weeks ago. Fifteen verses earlier in this chapter, you could let your eyes go up there and see this one. Verse 14 of chapter 10, you get this glorious gospel word that goes like this. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Or more literally, those who are being sanctified. Now there's a verse to put over against 29 and puzzle with. You talk about a puzzle. I'm glad those two verses come from the same chapter in the same book. Because unless you're willing to say this man has 
such a brain problem that he can't remember what he wrote 15 verses earlier, you got to come to terms with the fact that verse 14 says, those who are being sanctified have been perfected forever by a single sacrifice. And therein lies the gospel. So what are we going to do now? Verse 29 says, they were sanctified and now they're on their way to hell. And verse 14 says they were being sanctified and therefore they're perfected forever by a single all-sufficient sacrifice. Is this double talk? My conclusion is that the kind of sanctification in verse 14 and the kind in verse 29 are not the same. The process of spiritual Transformation into the likeness of Christ in verse 14 proves a genuine united heart to Christ. However, whatever it was in verse 29 simply exacerbates the judgment when a person throws over his face. So what could it be? I mean, what, 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 is, what is this sanctification in verse 29 after which you can be lost? It's really not hard to give an answer to that from the book of Hebrews and elsewhere in the Bible, or from this church's experience. For Here's what I think it means. It means a religious separation from the world as you draw near to the people of God and indeed to God. It means an outward purification of life. Like Jesus said, you cleanse the outside of the cup. It's coming under the influence of the truth Sunday after Sunday in the reading and the preaching and the singing and the praying of God's word, which has an inevitable moral impact upon people's lives who are not born again. It is coming under the influence of a loving congregation who act in a way and out of a spirit that is so different from the world. It, it, it begins to shape you and guide you even when you have not yet been changed inside. It is the coming under the influence of the, the ordinances and the taking in your hand that emblem of the most precious of all realities and drinking it to yourself. And Paul says, if you drink Unworthily, you drink damnation to yourself. So Paul had the same kind of trampling and scorning in view that the writer of the Hebrews does. And in all of this, they are visibly set apart. That's what sanctification means. Visibly set apart from the world, sanctified exactly like the people of Israel were by virtue of circumcision and many sacrifices and much blood work, most of whom were lost. Absolutely have to protect this doctrine of never can be lost, eternal security, perseverance of the saints, whatever you want to call it. He even takes and twists Hebrews 3.14 to, to death, where it says he takes the if you endure, then you were saved. If you don't endure, well, then you won't. Is that the truth of Hebrews 3.14? I think he's uh, pretty much twisting that beyond recognition. You have become partakers of Christ if you hold fast the beginning of your confidence steadfast to the end. There's two words in that passage, hold fast and steadfast. Look them up. Those words are powerful, meaning the reverse. If you don't hold fast and are steadfast, you won't be a partaker of the divine nature. Well, you never were to begin with. No, that ain't what it's saying. Just like all these other scriptures that talk about that. Now, brother, and I remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly the word I preached, Otherwise, you have believed in vain, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. If you hold firmly, if you keep in memory, I think it says in the King James Version, kind of tone it down a little bit so these wolves can deceive you. But it says, if you hold firmly, that's the word there, if you keep my commandments, that's the same word, same word. If you hold fast, guard, keep, diligently strive to keep these things. Uh, another scripture, uh, one more. One more, but now 
He has been reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Most of them stop right there in Colossians. That's, that's just Colossians 1, 22 and 23. I've heard many of these, these wolves quote 22 and leave 23 out. Why? Because 23 then says, yeah, he'll present you holy and blameless without blemish in his sight if you continue in the face, grounded steadfast and immovable. And hold your hope out to the end, to the gospel. That's the gospel you heard that was proclaimed to you from the beginning, which I, Paul, have become a servant. If you continue in the faith. So if you don't, you won't inherit the kingdom. You won't be presented blameless. You'll be like that scripture in Revelation 22, 11, as we read. You'll be vile. You'll be not doing the right thing, found not doing the right thing. And you'll be cast away because you didn't do what was right. What was right from your heart. So, he goes back to Hebrews 10.14 again about those who are being sanctified forever. And how that, how that you know, just blows out of the water any, any, any warning in, in, in 28 through 31. But yet, how can that possibly extend to willful sin against the blood? as, as is, is being said here. Of course, it was uh, for all time not to be repeated, as he alludes to. Yes, it's not going to be repeated. That's why it says, that's why it says, no sacrifice remains. That's why it's so dangerous and deadly. That's why it's worse to do this than to sin against Moses' law, where you were killed for the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose, it says in that scripture. That's why. Not because it's not going to be repeated again. That's ludicrous. It's because of the nature of this sacrifice, the completeness of it, and then you sin against it. You had your sins washed away. You were purified of the blood of the by the blood of the covenant, made a partaker of the Spirit by the divine nature. Then you sin against it. What is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God? No wonder he says that. What, what a warning. The, the whole, most dangerous thing you can possibly do is sin presumptuously. That's what that willfully means. Because no sacrifice remains. Imagine, imagine that you can present the sacrifice on the altar, sprinkle it with the blood of the covenant, and then call it unclean. That's what Piper's doing here. He's saying that they were sanctified, but not really sanctified. That they were presented on that altar, sprinkled with that blood, but they were still unclean on the inside. How can that be? The illustration stands, the type, the figures and types, all through Hebrews. That's how it, you present yourself a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. The blood is applied to purify the heart. Then you trample the blood. That's what he's talking about here. It's beyond any shadow of a doubt. He's talking about people that had the blood to trample. People that were never saved to begin with, which this text definitely does not talk about, cannot possibly trample the blood because it was never applied to them. So who, what teaching here is guaranteed then to send you straight to hell? Piper's teaching. See, he goes to great lengths to prove his doctrine to say how the sanctifications aren't the same in this verse and that verse, and it's just pure speculation. It's just a pure, it's just a pure uh, idea, of the vain imagination. It cannot be proved. The text proves otherwise. You trample the blood. How can you trample it if it was never applied in the first place, as I just alluded to? So this outward purification that he, that he speaks of, it might be a valid point. In some sense, like the Pharisees were outly purified by uh, the rituals and keeping their, the rules and the regulations. But that's exactly what's happening in imputed righteousness. You're outwardly purified, not inwardly. You, you're never inwardly. You say, well, it'll be slowly imparted, little by little, uh, step it. No, and it never does. We, we see that evident in the behavior of the people. You're declared righteous. You remain sinful. We can play those quotes. You'd like us to play those quotes again? We, we don't have to. We played them enough times. But see, how can these people then be under any influence to the better, as he suggests? 
when everything that these guys preach is designed to keep you in bondage to your sin, to never walk and work and obey and do the right thing from your heart. N none of it. None of it. You blackball God. You sin every day. You never obey. You can't obey. You can't do what's right. You're a bad Christian. You wallow. Your sins of today are going to be forgiven uh, for next week. And this is to somebody's advantage. I say hogwash. It couldn't possibly be to anyone's advantage. And we see that reflected in the behavior of professed Christians. But again, Piper uses great swelling words of emptiness to try to prove something that can't be proved. And what's he do? He butchers the truth because he's a soul butcher, like all these men. Because nobody under this doctrine could possibly tell the difference between a sinning saint and, and somebody that was never saved to begin with. There's simply no distinction in conduct or in purity or in faith. There's nothing, because none of these things apply. None of, these, none of these evidences of faith. Just ask these guys, well, what's the evidence of salvation? Well, a person doesn't have to be this. That, well, how? If he's declared righteous, if it's purely forensic, if nothing matters that he does, he's forgiven in advance, the sins aren't remembered against him, then how can anything in his conduct or his purity, his behavior towards God, make any difference? There's no distinction. No one can incriminate that person. No wonder they say you can't judge. Certainly you can't. And Piper's a hypocrite for even saying that these people in Hebrews chapter 10 were never saved to begin with. How can he possibly know when he can say he's going to sin now and be forgiven already next week? Well, how, why can't they? What a contradiction. What a contradiction. So you see the summary here then is these guys preach what's called Reformed theology. Thousands of these wolves are preaching this on the radio and the TV and writing books and study Bibles. And all, all millions of people are under the influence of this lie. And it's not even in the pages of Scripture. They, Jesus didn't teach it. The apostles didn't teach it. James certainly didn't teach it. Paul didn't teach it. I know they can twist the Scriptures just like Peter says. They twist them to their own destruction. But all false teachers twist the Scriptures. Every cult that is ever in existence twists the scriptures. Piper's dangerous because he's so good at it. He speaks so well. He can use those great swelling words upon you and persuade you that these things are true. That's why he's so dangerous. But these men's mouths must be stopped before they destroy more souls. And that's what we're endeavoring to do here. To stop them before they dispense this awful doctrine upon another generation of people. And we ask, who will stand and contend earnestly for the truth and for the truth of the gospel? So God is seeking the faithful, the obedient of heart, to do just that. We ask you to be one of those. And you and I sin every day. We blackball God day and night. We give Him a vote of no confidence, thank you, as we go our own way every day of our lives. Persistence in sin destroys the assurance of salvation. That all the sins that I have committed will commit, perhaps even while I'm preaching by some attitude of mine, or tomorrow will not be held against me. Why? Because at the end of the age, Christ appeared once for all to put away Perseverance sin by the Perseverance to the end himself. in faith is a sign that you did become a partaker. Failure to persevere to the end is a sign that you did not ever become a partaker of Christ. That's what that verse seems to me very clearly now, teaches. I want you to get this because... Picture this. It's the once-for-allness in history outside of us objectively that guarantees that all of our sin is the righteousness, past is God's God's righteousness. It's His. It's perfect. It's holy. It's utterly unimpeachable. It's all we'd ever need. And now it is on the way, not through works, as though you could somehow imitate it or earn it, but through faith as a gift to, to rest upon you and clothe you and be there for you. Covering you. You lose your reward. Your joy is lessened in what might have been a great celebration of a lifetime of fuller. In other words, it's possible to be a Christian and a bad teacher.
It is possible to be a Christian and a bad Sunday school teacher. It is possible to be a Christian and a harmful small group leader. It is possible to be a Christian and a bad pastor, a harmful teacher of God's Finally, people. Finally, sin is serious. Fourth, because it can put you beyond the reach of hope. You will never get right with God by your works. You will never have a righteousness that suffices with God by virtue of your works. It's over. There is no way to heaven. Then it's by over. Works. It's over. The sin that I will commit on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, was put away 2,000 years ago. Finished. Over. That sin is over. It's gone. It will not be held against me. Now, if that doesn't grip you as the most glorious news in all the world, I can't imagine what would be good news. Promise that you're going to follow Christ. You and I, John, have known Christ for years and we struggle following Him. Can you imagine somebody out there saying, oh, I'm going to follow Jesus? That's not the gospel. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. First of all, repentance is never a mandate for salvation. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You and I sin every day. We blackball God day and day. We give him a vote of no confidence. Thank you as we go our own way every day of our lives. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Whether you sin in the past, whether you sin in the present, whether you sin in the future, even just before you die, it's all sin paid for in full by Jesus Christ. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And you say, well, what about, what about when I sin? He permits me to sin. He permits it. He doesn't sanction it. But even that, you couldn't possibly sin unless God in his sovereignty chose to let you sin. That doesn't mean he forces you to sin. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You have Paul and James set against each other, but the truth of the matter is, since the entire Bible teaches salvation by grace through faith, you would have James set against the entire other 65 books of the Bible. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? I'm a natural born liar. You're a natural born liar. So let's just, let's just be honest, because we are in church. We're all liars. Know ye not that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's impossible, you hear me? It is absolutely impossible for anybody whom God loved before time to finally and ultimately be lost. That's how secure our salvation is. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall.